We've got three very good speakers uh, here today who are able to reach out to a, a very wide audience, which I think is indicated by the number of people who are here today. Uh, and our first speaker, speaker is uh, James Hannam, who uh, did a, a PhD at uh, Cambridge in uh, history and philosophy of science on, on medieval science. Uh, he published a, a book resulting from that work in 2009 called God's Philosophers, which uh, uh, put medieval physics, I think, on the map for many people, and followed it up with one two years later on the uh, genesis of science, which of course is in the uh, medieval period. And he's speaking today, uh, as you can see, on medieval physics in Oxford. So, James, if you'd like to come forward, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, that kind introduction. I should say Genesis of Science and God's Philosophers are the same book. It's just that for reasons unbeknownst to me, the American publishers insisted on changing the title. Um, so please don't go out and buy both of them. You'll be <laughs> disappointed. Um, should I? Um, yes, so you don't have a... No, okay, that's fine. Um, Well, it really is uh, great to be here um, at Oxford and at a conference on, on medieval physics. Um, I uh, did my undergraduate degree here uh, in physics back in the early 90s. Um, and I, I have to admit that uh, despite four years um, at Oxford, I had absolutely no idea at the time about the illustrious history of the physics um, at Oxford during, during the Middle Ages, and I probably wasn't alone in that. Um, indeed, when I told family and friends that I was going to go to Cambridge and do a, uh, a PhD for three or four years um, on medieval science, they were concerned because they didn't think that even at Cambridge it was possible to do a PhD on a subject which, as far as they were concerned, didn't even exist. <laughs> in fact, it was a, a few years after I left Oxford that I got interested in medieval science, um, and in particular that came out of looking at the relationship between science and theology and digging a little bit deeper into the uh, common perception that uh, science and religion have been in conflict in the church holding back science. And I discovered some extremely interesting figures such as the Merton calculators from the work, like so many others did, of the late David Lindbergh. Am I half an hour? I'd like to briefly ask these three introductory questions, as I understand um, that uh, many of us here are um, by no means specialists in the, in the rather obtuse subject of, of medieval physics. So who was doing physics in Oxford during the Middle Ages? What exactly were they up to? And uh, why were they doing it? Well, here's my incomplete list of Oxford physicists during the Middle Ages. Now, I can't obviously run through um, very much about all of these people who will be here all day. And of course, we have speakers uh, coming up very shortly to tell us a great deal more about Robert Gostest and, and Roger Bacon. But there are just a few points on this list that I would like to bring out, if I may. I mentioned earlier um, that I was originally drawn into finding out about the so-called conflict between science and religion. And in fact, Oxford's history of um, uh, medieval physics gives us very much the opposite impression that science and Christianity were rubbing on very well indeed. Indeed, there was a great deal of harmony between them. And one way to see that is by looking at this list. Robert Gostest uh, became Bishop of Lincoln after he left Oxford. There are no less than three Archbishops of Canterbury on this list. John Peckham, Robert Kilwardby, and Thomas Bradwardine. Richard of Wallingford became abbot of St. Norman's Abbey, an uh, extremely prestigious role, uh, at least equal to being a bishop at the time. Incidentally, Richard of Wallingford's is the picture that was on the publicity uh, for this conference, and a rather strange splodge that he has on his face uh, is because he caught uh, leprosy and, and actually died of it. 
So it's very clear um, from the eminent churchmen on this list that an interest in science and being practicing in science was in no way going to have a negative impact on an ecclesiastical career. Um, a couple more points, I suppose there's, there's, there's quite a lot of Franciscan friars on this list, Roger Bacon, John Peckham, John Dunn Scottus and William of Ockham and, and uh, uh, we'll be hearing more later on also about um, the importance of the friars in uh, the development of medieval science. I've added a couple of names that probably would be um, only familiar to two specialists, Walter Burley um, for instance, he um, was in fact extremely influential, though very much um, a uh, minority figure today, as one of the leaders of the, the so-called realist school. There was a great argument between the followers of William of Ockham, who was one of the leading nominalists, uh, who said that universals um, are simply names that we give categories of things. Uh, Walter Burley um, was one of the leading realists, um, and uh, he was a uh, almost um, a platonic idealist, he considered that um, universals were very much real um, and actually had an objective existence. That was a, um, a debate which ran throughout the Middle Ages. And I've added Paul of Venice to this list, although he only spent three years at Oxford um, at the end of the 14th century. But he's one of the important conduits uh, by which the ideas of Oxford physicists um, made it to the continent um, and in fact he uh, returned to Venice and it's probably not coincidence that the earliest printed editions of many of the works of these Oxford physicists were produced um, in Venice uh, in the second half of the 15th century. And finally the four Merton calculators, I will come more br briefly to uh, why they are so celebrated a little bit later, all four of them were mathematicians who were active at Merton College in the second third of the 14th century. So, what exactly was physics during the Middle Ages? It's obviously um, very different from the subject that we understand today. Well, the agenda for physics, and indeed the agenda for the whole of science um, during the Middle Ages was set out um, by Aristotle, other ancient Greeks, and in commentaries written in Arabic during the intervening period. And a similar event for medieval science was the fall of the Moorish city of Toledo in Spain in 1085, part of the so-called reconquest of Spain um, from the Islamic invaders. And the city's libraries were captured intact by the Christian forces and they were found to, create, to contain a treasure trove of ancient knowledge. <coughs> knowledge of Greek had largely been lost, it had never been great in Western Europe, it was largely lost at the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD. And from then on, scholars of Western Europe, who could only really read Latin, were dependent on Latin textbooks, compendiums and encyclopedias for their knowledge of science. In other words, they were having to read everything second-hand. That meant that although they had heard of people like Ptolemy, Euclid, Aristotle, with very few exceptions, they had no opportunities to read the original works. But that all began to change with the fall of Toledo, because all of a sudden, there they were, the complete works of Aristotle, complete copies of Euclid's elements and Ptolemy's Almagest. Western scholars descended on Spain and began the translation movement where all of these texts written in Arabic were translated into Latin and then began to spread around Europe. A little bit later, the original Greek texts of Euclid, Ptolemy and others were found in libraries in Sicily and in the Byzantine Empire and direct translations from the Greek to Latin were made and these texts formed the foundation of the syllabus at the new universities, of which Oxford was one of the first and one of the most prestigious. And if I could say a quick word about the university as a concept, this was something which was new in the Middle Ages. There hadn't previously been an institution like this. 
because a university was a corporation. That meant that it was a collection of people making their own rules and facing the world with a common face. But it also meant that the universities were not dependent on any particular individuals. Because they were corporations, they were effectively immortal. Indeed, Oxford has been going now for coming up to a thousand years. And their organisation gave the universities an unprecedented degree of intellectual freedom because they were able to guard their privileges. They became adept at playing the church off against the state. And if they got upset with the local environment, students and masters would just up sticks and leave, go somewhere else. Something, in fact, that happened to Oxford in 1209, where, following a dispute um, over um, a student's girlfriend, the uh, considerable amount of the university moved to East Anglia and founded another university there, which you may have heard of. <laughs> Physics was primarily based on this book, Aristotle's Physics. And as far as Aristotle is concerned, it was a study of change of all sorts. That encompassed motion, growth, decay. And it fell under the general rubric of natural philosophy, which also included subjects which today we could call psychology, cosmology, meteorology, the study of the soul, the constitution of the universe um, and um, geology and the weather. Now, initially, physics, as Aristotle perceived it, was a qualitative subject. It wasn't one which involved itself particularly with mathematics. And indeed, Aristotle seems to imply that it's not possible to use mathematical theorems to prove causes in physics. And causes really were the foundation of what it meant to be studying physics and natural philosophy during the Middle Ages. These, these were subjects which were asking why questions, as you might expect from the title of natural philosophy. And in that, they differed from mathematical subjects such as optics and astronomy. They relied on geometry and they were very much considered to be, uh, although I do admittedly generalise a little bit here, they were considered to be descriptive subjects. Astronomy could use mathematics to describe how the planets moved in the sky, but didn't necessarily explain why they did what they did. Now, Aristotle's book, The Physics, was part of the curriculum here at Oxford and also at almost every other medieval university. Now, this is the Oxford syllabus for a Master of the Arts in 1431. You'll see that back then, to get an MA at Oxford involved considerably more work than it does nowadays. <laughs> We've actually got Oxford syllabuses all going all the way back to 1268, but this one has the advantage of being complete and really quite detailed. And really, if you looked at the syllabus from any other medieval university, you'll see it was reasonably similar. And before a student could even go on to doing their MA, they needed to get a Bachelor of the Arts, and that concentrated on the first seven of these, oh, the first three of the seven liberal arts, the so-called trivium of rhetoric, grammar, and logic. Trivium being the beginning of studies where we get the word trivial from. After um, completing their BA, they could move on to an MA and they would start studying a quadrivium, the second four of the seven liberal arts, effectively mathematical subjects we would understand them today. Although we do have to be careful that we don't just assume that we understand exactly what all these words mean. Arithmetic, as Boethius, the uh, sixth century author, understood it, was not talking when he said, talked about arithmetic about doing sums. He was interested in what we might call number theory. He considered that the point of mathematics was to raise the mind to a more abstract level, above the mundane. That said, how to do sums was part of the course at most universities, um, using Arabic-derived textbooks such as the Algorithmus. Geometry um, had a similar sort of function. 
Um, the way that Euclid was able to take a few postulates and produce this amazing system um, of geometry really impressed medieval minds, and they thought that it was excellent mental training. But it's worth noting that the other two authors for geometry, Alhazan and Watello, were both, in fact, most best known for writing on optics. As far as um, the medievals were concerned, optics was, to a great extent, a form of applied geometry. Back to Boethius for music, that's not singing and certainly not uh, composing music, that's uh, understanding the mathematics of harmonies and such, like again, to train the mind. Um, and astronomy, um, a term to master Ptolemy's Almagest. Uh, I don't think anyone may ever managed that. Um, it's a very difficult and complicated book. And generally speaking, um, textbooks were used, such as the theory of the planets here, and more usually, um, John Sackville Bosco's The Sphere, uh, John Sackville Bosco, um, another English natural philosopher, of which actually we know very little. After all of that, you move on to natural philosophy proper. And um, the core of that subject is, is the physics. And we know that, not be just because it's top of the list, uh, although it also invariably is, but also because of the number of surviving manuscripts and the number of surviving commentaries and the number of surviving textbooks on the physics far outnumbers pretty much all the other kinds of natural philosophy put together. So what was it that was so special about Oxford physics? Well, I think the most significant figures were the Oxford calculators, like the Merton calculators. And let me briefly explain why I think they're so important. I noted earlier that Aristotle was quite suspicious of the ability of mathematics to make any kind of contribution to natural philosophy. And in his physics, although he does, in a manner of words, try and explain the relationships between, uh, say, force and speed and resistance and speed when an object is moving, uh, he does so in a very wordy and non-rigorous kind of way. Um, and Thomas Bradwardine thought that this wouldn't do at all. And Bradwardine was absolutely insistent that if you want to do physics properly, you have to master the mathematics as well. And he and the other Oxford calculators were really the people who injected mathematics into physics, something which we take for granted so much today that it's very difficult to imagine that people were studying physics for centuries without really ever thinking to do it. But in 1328, in his Tractatus de Proportionibus, Thomas Bradwardine decided that he was going to produce an equation of motion for Aristotle's physics, which would be rigorous and actually reflect Aristotle's theory rather than Aristotle's own exercise in arm waving. Now, I have obviously here used modern notation, and that was certainly totally unknown during the Middle Ages, but if you write out um, medieval mathematics in full, um, it's very, very hard to follow because there's no notation at all. It's all in words. And Bradwardine um, had never heard of a logarithm. He sort of accidentally invented them, but um, didn't explore their properties. And it wasn't um, until a few centuries later that the logarithm became part of um, an accepted part of mathematics. But well, what Bradwardine wanted to do was he wanted to show that if an object is subject to a force, resistance has to be overcome before that object will move at all. Now, Aristotle seems to imply that if you have a very, very small force up against an enormous resistance, the object will still move, albeit very slowly. That's obviously not true. And Aristotle knew it wasn't true. So Bradwardine says, right, so what we need to say is that speed is proportional to force over resistance just as long as force is greater than the initial resistance. And the logarithm of one, as I'm sure you will know, is actually zero. So until the force is bigger than a resistance, as far as Barbadine is concerned, speed is nil. And it's only after that that the object starts to move. Now, that he wasn't trying to reform Aristotle's physics. He was trying to put it onto a rigorous basis. 
So, for example, you'll also note that Aristotle believed that if the resistance was nil, speed would be infinite. If you divide um, anything by zero, you get infinity. That's the same with Bradbordine's um, formula as well. In fact, Aristotle used the fact that his um, uh, suggestion that uh, if uh, resistance was nil, um, speed must be infinite as an argument that a vacuum could not exist. Because in a vacuum there's no air resistance, therefore everything would move with infinite speed. That's impossible. There can't be a vacuum. One of the finest pieces of reverse wrong argumentation in the history of science. It's seven years after Bradwardine wrote, William of Haytersbury, in his Regulae Solvendi Sophismata 1335, wrote down for the first time the mean speed theorem. Unlike Bradwardine's um, formula, this theorem has lasted the years. It is, in fact, one of the first things you learn at GCSE when you start to do mechanics. It's a formula that tells you how far something moves when it's travelling with constant acceleration, or, as the medievals called it, uniformly difform acceleration. And um, this was another example of mathematics being injected into physics. And the formula was extraordinarily successful among the community of medieval physicists. In fact, people started using it for all sorts of things. They, instead of just for distance, any kind of um, quality at all could be inserted into that. So heat, for example, or colour, or some things that seem completely inappropriate to us, um, like holiness or, or goodness, could be um, applied uh, to the mean speed theorem. So it's something that after uh, the mid-14th century you find in a great deal of commentaries on Aristotle's physics. In fact, we can trace uh, its development through the Middle Ages and into the modern era. On the, uh, the right-hand side is a manuscript of a work by a Frenchman, Nicole Orem, who was a master and a mathematician at the University of Paris in the mid-14th century. Uh, he uh, also went on, in fact, to become a bishop later in his career. Uh, and what Orem did is he took the mean speed theorem and he proved it graphically. In other words, what he said was, well, we can say that the uniform acceleration is a uniform gradient. And if we can do that, we can say that the area under the line corresponds to distance. And once we've translated those physical properties into um, a geometrical diagram, we can start playing around with it, and we can show which bits equal other bits. And fairly easily, using a graph like that, you can prove the mean speed theorem, that distance equals a half acceleration times times squared. And everyone thought this was splendid as well. So they started inserting RM's proof into new manuscripts of William of Haytersbury's book. And in fact, the middle picture is one of the early printed editions of William of Haytersbury's um, original um, work that contains the mean speed theorem, um, but has had added to it um, some capsules showing the graphical <laughs> proof of Erem. And this is an interesting book because we know that Galileo read it while he was a student at Pisa in the late 16th century. And sure enough, when Galileo produced his dialogue concerning two new sciences, his most important book of science published very late in his life while he was under house arrest, um, we see the same graphical proof for the mean speed theorem. Um, Galileo kind of implies that he worked this out for himself, which is one of the reasons that medieval um, physics and, and the important work that was done was effectively forgotten for three or four hundred years until the early 20th century um, when um, the work of people like the Merton calculators was rediscovered. Well, one of the most important things about the mean speed theorem 
is that it describes an object falling under gravity. And despite all the purposes to which medieval scholars put the mean speed theorem to, they did not come up with that one. That was first proposed by a Spanish natural philosopher, Domingo de Soto, sometime in the mid-16th century. Although needless to say, Galileo says he invented that as well. So what was the purpose of medieval physics? We can be absolutely certain, although when you read popular history of science, it isn't always clear, we can be absolutely certain that developing modern science was not on the minds of medieval physicists. <coughs> to understand, I think, what they were trying to do is not really to understand their individual motivations at all. I suspect that the Merton calculators were doing what they were doing um, because they were good at it, because they enjoyed it. That's the kind of thing that really does motivate most of us to get up in the mornings. But the question I think was interesting is why did society, specifically the church, consider that it was worthwhile resourcing people to do physics? What was the institutional point of the subject? Well, I think the key to understanding that is to realise that physics in those days was not the study of an impersonal, objective nature in the way that we understand nature today. It was the study of God's personal <coughs> creation. As far as all these medieval scientists were concerned, the universe had been created in six days around about 5,300 years before their time. And the reason that they were interested in studying God's creation was that they believed that it could be used to bolster the Christian faith. And to take just a couple of specific examples, um, physics could be used specifically against, as arguments against certain heretics. Among the most notorious heretics in the Middle Ages were the Carthers in southwestern France. And the Carthers were dualists, they were Manicheans. And what they believed, at least as far as we can tell, given that everything we know about them comes from the files of the Inquisition, they believed that there were good and evil gods, not just one god. And the good god was the governor of spiritual things, he was in heaven. And the evil god was responsible for the creation of the material world, and as a result, the material world was irredeemably wicked. The way to be saved was to cut yourself off from the material world, concentrate entirely on spiritual things. And Orthodox Christians said, no, that's, that's totally untrue. Look, it says in the Bible that the one God created the world. And they used physics as a way to demonstrate that the dualists were wrong, because physics showed that the world was orderly, that it followed rules, that it seemed to show the characteristics that we would expect of something that had been created by a good God, not something which had been created by a wicked God. And because studying physics was able to tell medieval philosophers something about the character of its creator, that was one of the reasons that natural philosophy together with ethics and metaphysics was a subject that almost everybody who wanted to become a theologian had to study before they were even allowed to enter the theology faculty. Another thing that physics did was to help Christianity with its essential argument over the nature of free will. It's completely essential to an understanding of Christianity that human beings have moral freedom. So what medieval physics did by showing that the universe worked according to fixed laws of cause and effect was that it allowed the world to become a stage upon which human beings could make real moral choices with real consequences. And in fact this was important because there was a constant 
argument through the Middle Ages on the question of determinism, the extent to which the universe's um, workings are determined or free. Um, and one of the major ways that this manifested itself was in a question of, of astrology. Radical astrologers said that people's fates are determined entirely by the stars. Uh, that was believed, for example, by the Italian uh, astrologer Secco Scoli, who was burnt at the stake in Florence in 1327, um, as a result of saying that the reason that Jesus had such a rotten life, being born poor to a single mother and suffering a horrible death, was he'd been born under the wrong stars. You can imagine how well that went down with the Catholic Church. And in fact, in 1277, Stephen Tempier, the Bishop of Paris, had promulgated a list of 219 statements, um, which it was not allowed for a good Christian philosopher to hold. And again, he was effectively trying to steer philosophy away from a deterministic view of the world and insisting on the freedom of human beings to make free moral choices and the freedom of God to have created the world in the way that he saw fit. Similar statements, albeit a much shorter list of just 13, was actually um, promulgated at Oxford very shortly thereafter, where it caused an almighty stink, in fact. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, Robert Cawardy, who, who um, uh, published the list, um, was almost had to be taken into protective custody as a result um, of the argument that this entailed. I suppose one other point that's worth making about medieval physics um, is that it had no technological or practical um, uses at all, really. Uh, there were important uh, technological changes uh, in the Middle Ages, just, uh, just a couple of examples, a mechanical clock and uh, uh, spectacles were both invented um, in the 13th century. Um, but in fact, in neither case and in all the other cases of, of important te technological inventions of the Middle Ages, do we see that um, the physics that was going on um, in the universities feeding into um, technological or practical applications, and that's despite uh, Roger Bacon's famous statements about the uh, things that you might one day be able to do uh, as a result uh, of science, usually suggested that uh, um, he uh, foreshadowed the, the motor car and the plane, I believe. In fact, it wasn't until the 19th century that the idea of applied science as we know it today um, really came into being. I've only got half an hour, so that has been a necessarily a, a very brief introduction, um, and I, I hope that it has uh, set the stage somewhat for the uh, eminent scholars who we will be hearing from later today. Thank you. due to Averroes that the heavens are a mover but no resistance to motion. 
in which case they must move with infinite speed. As we look up, it takes 24 hours for the world to turn around. So that's a counterexample of refutation. What's the solution to the problem? Averroes invents inertia, the idea that bodies have an inherent resistance to motion other than gravitational resistance to motion. That's a very novel and important idea. Aquinas, a big follower of Averroes, then takes that idea and puts a resistance to motion in earthly bodies as well as celestial bodies. And from there, you get to Paul of Venice, who puts two and two together and works out that if the the force and the resistance are the same, then all bodies must fall with the same speed. An amazing novel prediction. That's an important development. It's not Oxford, it's Arabic and Aristotelian. Uh, so I'd just like to ask you why you don't acknowledge things like that. But Pierre Duen made very clear in his great work, Système du Monde, uh, being the person who uh, pointed out the importance of medieval physics. Okay, thank you. Well, to answer your question, uh, because I had half an hour and the subject of this conference is medieval physics at Oxford. Um, so I've talked about medieval physics at Oxford. You are quite right to say that there were very important developments across the rest of Europe, um, in particular at the University of Paris a little bit later um, in the 14th century. Uh, and I'm sorry that um, I haven't been able to cover all of that. Um, if I'm allowed to briefly plug uh, my book, uh, it does cover the whole of medieval science from 1000 AD up until Galileo, uh, and uh, does make it very clear that this is a, a pan-European story, um, of which uh, Oxford is just one of the many focal points. It's interesting that you, you mentioned that these medieval natural philosophers thought that they could use these uh, physics to, um, to disprove complete determinism, whereas later physicists thought the mechanics meant everything was deterministic. Could you say a little bit more about uh, how the medieval natural philosophers came to this conclusion? Um. Well, I'm not sure. New Newton would never have accepted that his mechanics was, was deterministic. He, he, he um, was, was very clear that uh, his system had to leave room for God. It is true that Newtonian um, physics was then taken um, forward to a um, more deterministic outcome uh, through the 18th and, and, and 19th centuries. Um, but it's probably fair to say uh, that uh, the people who were pushing the uh, deterministic um, view of, of, uh, of Newtonian physics like uh, uh, Laplace were um, definitely not Christians. Um, I think you mentioned that uh, the Christians were uh, opposed to dualism you know, dualism the good and evil of gods. Um, I was wondering, uh, how would the devil fit in that, from the Christian point of view? Would he not qualify as a, an evil god? I, I'm sorry, I didn't... Could I, I... I don't hear very well, so... Um. Um, I was just saying that when you were talking about... Um, when you talk about dualism, yes. which were good gods and evil gods, and the Christians were opposed <coughs> to that, um, how does the devil fit in? The devil. Yeah, the devil. Um, the well, devil the, 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 the according to Christian theology, the devil has no power. Um, the devil can tempt us to 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 be wicked, but um, in, in in most mainstream um, medieval medieval theologies, that the, the the devil can't do anything. He can't do miracles. He can't do magic. If a witch, for example, is actually doing magic, that's um, not from the devil. It, it, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't necessarily um, have to be anything at all. It's not until a bit later on that we, we get to the witch craze. Um, so there is a fundamental difference between a sort of a, 
uh, a smooth talking tempter and someone who can actually create the entire world and everything in it. Uh, Galileo gave great uh, credit to Archimedes. When were the works of Archimedes discovered and translated? I'm sorry? When were the works of Archimedes discovered and translated? Um, they were translated during the Middle Ages, um, but they are um, really quite hard. Uh, and although they were translated into Latin in, in uh, I think, the 13th century, they um, weren't subject to a huge amount um, of um, attention until the 16th century. Um, what's quite interesting is that the 16th century edition of Archimedes that everybody talks about is simply a print of the translation uh, that had been made in the Middle Ages, uh, although the editor, whose name escapes him now, sort of pretended that he uh, did it himself. Um, which is a fairly typical piece of uh, humanistic subterfuge. Uh, I'm quite puzzled by your remark about applications of the science, because uh, you said that they didn't apply it until the 19th century, but are you referring uh, specifically to university physics? Uh, for example, Somebody mentioned Archimedes that's in the ancient world, and he was very interested in applying his scientific knowledge to uh, engineering in some ways. Uh, and uh, I, I thought that there was many uh, instances in the ancient world where people were applying mathematical or scientific knowledge to technology. Um, can, I, can I ask you to repeat that? You're a little bit far away for me to have the oh, lip read, so if... Yeah. if Sorry. No, uh, it's, it's not, it's not going to help you, because you're, you're, you're just too far away. So if, if I could ask... Um, go oh, to repeat or yeah. sorry. Yeah. I was just puzzled by what you said about applications of science yeah. that it didn't occur until the 19th century because there seemed to be plenty of examples in the ancient world. Somebody mentioned Archimedes, for example, or um, where he was interested in applying science or mathematics to devices and many other examples. So yes. Uh, um, but, 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 but you, you, what we have to do is get right which direction, yes, okay. what the direction of travel is. Um, yeah. There yeah. is a pseudo Aristotelian book on mechanics, for instance. Right. But that simply describes the mechanical devices which were known at the time. It's not as if Aristotle or pseudo Aristotle was uh, inventing things which, uh, as a result of his scientific knowledge, were then being turned into technological applications. And we see, we see, th we see this an awful lot. Um, in, in the modern era, um, thermodynamics was invented uh, as a result of people trying to figure out how a steam engine worked. The steam engine was not invented as a result of people trying to find applications for thermodynamics. So it's not until the 19th century that the direction of travel from uh, scientific uh, theories to practical applications become something which is remotely common. It, 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 it's usually the other way around. So isn't there a dialectic? You seem to be thinking about theory in a very pure form. Sorry? Isn't there a dialectical process of back and forth between theory and application? Mm, probably not until the 19th century. No. I see very little sign of that. <laughs> Um, we have time for one more question, which, which I will ask and you know, abuse my position. Um, we, you, you said at the beginning that, that there was a, a, an interesting, not harmony, but the, the fact that some of these people became archbishops of Canterbury and so on uh, showed that there was a very substantial religious purpose to their work. But can you say something about the, the obvious tensions between the arts faculty and the divinity faculty in the same period, which gives rise to the condemnations uh, by Etienne Tompier in 1270 and 1277. I mean, how long does that go on for? Uh, what's the situation at Oxford in terms of relations between these groups? Well, the, um, the dispute at Paris that, that you mentioned, um, that starts at the beginning of the 13th century, where um, for a brief period, the, the natural books of Aristotle were, were banned in Paris Arts faculty altogether until um, the Pope decided to, to reinstate them. And it was, as I say, a dispute that rumbled on for decades. And 
1277 condemnations were sort of the, the climax of, um, of that, um, and they drew the line between uh, what the theology faculty was supposed to be up to um, and what the philosophers in the arts faculty were supposed to be up to. Um, we don't see to the, the dispute to the same extent um, at Oxford. The disputes at Oxford, and these also um, reflect disputes in Paris as well, um, were questions about what you had to do uh, in the arts faculty before you were allowed to become a theologian. Um, the friars in particular were very resentful of the fact that their members were required to do a, a BA and an MA before they could actually become theologians. The friars thought, well, our guys are clever enough and well-trained enough, we can just put them straight into the theology faculty, thank you. Um, and to some extent that ended up happening. Um, though there was definitely a, a political power play dimension to those sorts of disputes as well as actually the pure um, theological one. Um, and like the normalism, realism dispute, the determinism dispute, none of these were really um, wholly resolved in the Middle Ages. Perhaps they haven't been wholly resolved even today. Um, so, but I don't think those are examples necessarily of uh, conflicts between science and religion. Um, for a start, generally speaking, the Christians were on both sides, so the Christians always won the argument. Um, but there certainly are examples uh, during the Middle Ages uh, of, of people who, who stepped out of the, the pale of acceptable thought, of which Secret Scully, who I mentioned, was, was one. Um, so um, I, I prefer to, to characterise, if I, if I had to, um, the relationship between uh, um, medieval science and medieval theology as one of, uh, um, of creative tension, if I could put it like that. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.